Welcome to City Talk, a weekly conversation produced by the City of Waco to inform you about city events and projects. Each week, we'll bring you interesting topics with city staff and community leaders to highlight how Waco is an exciting place to live and work. Well, good morning and welcome to City Talk. My name is Trey Busby. I'm the Animal Services Director for the City of Waco. And today I have Dr. Michael Vallon with us, our shelter vet. Dr. Vallon, how are you doing today, sir? Doing great. How are you? Doing wonderful. Dr. Vallon, Dr. Vallon tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, not too much to tell that's too interesting. I'm a small town kid. I grew up near Bynum, Texas, went to high school in Abbott, Texas, graduated 2012, went to Texas A&M for my undergraduate Graduated there with honors uh, from biomedical sciences, got a bachelor's in that, and then I applied to veterinary school, was lucky enough to get in first try. Did four years at Texas A&M Veterinary School and got my DVM, passed all my boards, and was lucky enough to find an uh, occupation here with the city of Waco as a shelter veterinarian. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you're with us working at the shelter. Tell us what attracted you to shelter medicine. I guess what attracted me to shelter medicine, in my, um, in my training as a veterinarian at Texas A&M, I actually tracked kind of a mixed tract equine. I wanted to work small animal and horses, and those are kind of the two areas I really enjoy. I enjoy dogs, I enjoy horses, I enjoy cats as well. But um, I had more experience in my undergraduate years and my veterinary school years with horses and actual clinical settings, and I wanted to get more experience in the clinicals and especially a surgical setting with small animals. I'd never really had a lot of opportunity with surgery in small animal medicine. I had extensive in equine just from my background with my mentor in veterinary medicine, but I wanted to get more and this opportunity arose just kind of by luck circumstance effectively and I got more than I could ask for in all regards of small animal surgery and a wide range of things and I've really enjoyed it and I think it's helped me as a veterinarian coming right out of school. Right. Well, I know that you and I started on the same day. Yes, we kind of came at the same time. And, and since we've arrived there, you know, our live exit rate has been above 90%. Yes. Um, tell us about some of the benefits of having a vet on staff at a shelter like ours. Absolutely. I mean, like you say, a lot of a lot of cities don't and a lot of counties don't even have a veterinarian on staff at shelter. And they are forced to rely on really the good graces and the charity of local veterinarians. And that's a great thing in and of itself. But Having a veterinarian on staff there all the time helps us out in a lot, and we get – because a shelter is kind of like a field hospital when it comes to cases that come in, hit by car, anything from that to, you know, fall and overheat heat stroke, all kinds of things. If we have a veterinarian on staff, we can treat right then. We don't have to just try to see if we can get someone in or get that animal somewhere. We can triage right then. We can treat, and you end up with a lot more animals making it because – we can get that medicine and we can get that treatment initially. We don't have to wait till someone can get away from their business and their time that they really have to dedicate to, to do something charity. Right. And you, you talk about a lot of the, the good work that you do down there medically. Tell us about one of the best success stories you've had so far down there with some of the animals. We've had a lot of great success stories. I mean, we've had some that have come in, you know, hit by car with broken legs that we've had to do, unfortunately had to do amputations on, but they bounce back and do great. But one of the really good ones we've had real recently was a dog named Robinson. He was picked up on the side of the road in Robinson, actually. He was uh, he was blind. He had uh, basically end-stage glaucoma in both eyes. Both his eyes were swollen up from that disease, and they were non-functional. He couldn't see. All they were was painful. And he was huddling in the rain like, against the fence, the only thing he could find to guide himself, and he was just stuck there. Um, ACO found him, brought him into us. We determined that the eyes were non-functional and really only causing him anything, nothing but pain. And we elected to do what's called a nucleation, where we remove those eyes and we take away that pain. And since they're non-functional, he really senses no difference. And he has, when he first got here, Robinson was scared beyond all belief, would barely move, would barely acknowledge another person that touched him or talked to him. And now he's really started to open up. He's moving around in the shelter, in the clinic. He's gone to several fosters. He's just doing wonderful. And I'm really glad we could help him out from his situation. I mean, it does sound like a gruesome procedure that losing both of his eyes, but in the state he was in, they were nothing but hurting him, and now he's doing just amazing. Well, that's that's a great story, and it's a, it's a, it's a record or a, a testament to the uh, quality of care that we're able to provide to those animals down Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And uh, um, what's the most interesting thing you've uh, learned since coming on with the city at the shelter? I guess I would say the most interesting thing I've learned is, you know, there's a lot of stuff you, you learn in vet school and you learn in medical school, as there's, I'm sure with human doctors as well, that you, you hear about, you talk about, but you don't ever actually get to try. And that's one of the things I've really liked about the city and the shelter is I've gotten to try a lot of things that if I went into private practice initially, I probably wouldn't have got to do for some time until I was a much more experienced veterinarian and 
had a lot more time out, but I've gotten a lot of experience with surgeries that are a lot more advanced that a lot of students just don't get the chance to try. And I've really enjoyed that. And I've learned that a lot of it's really just having the confidence to do it and feeling, you know, remembering your training and going through it just like anything else. You mentioned something in, a, in, your, com- in the, your comment about students just a few moments ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that, that we're working on various programs with uh, some of the vet tech uh, yes, programs locally. Um, tell us uh, about the externship program that we implement down in our shelter. We have an externship program with uh, McLennan Community College. They uh, bring in some of their vet techs to do their externships in the clinic, whether they have an interest in shelter medicine or just small animal medicine in general. They can come in and help us with surgeries, see surgeries, get to help anesthetize animals, prepare animals for surgery, scrub them, prepare them, um, get them uh, awake, recover them from surgery and all that. They also get to help us with wound care, cleaning, other basic things we do for animals every day. And I think it's it's really helpful. I mean, it's the same thing. Luckily, as vet students, we get lucky enough to go to those kind of externships. And I was lucky enough to externship at a shelter and really enjoyed it. And I think it helps a lot of techs. We also have been doing one with the Humane Society through with uh, high school students. And I think it's really great for them who are interested in the career of either a veterinarian or a vet tech to get them some experience so they can really be sure if that's something they want to do. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, 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 Humane Society of Central Texas, our on-site shelter partner, which yes. they, they help us with the fostering. And, and the rescues and the adoption of animals. Um, you work closely with Humane Society. Tell us about that, those activities. Yes, we here at the clinic, we try to work closely with them because we will get animals in that are medically require more care than the shelter can provide. Unfortunately, we don't have, a, we're not a emergency clinic. We're not a hospital. We don't have all night staff that can basically maintain these animals through the night if they need fluids or overnight care. So if we have an animal that comes in that requires that intense level of care, such as maybe they need to have their bladder expressed or they need fluids or they need to be observed overnight, we try to work with the Humane Society to work with their rescue partners to get them out to rescues that have that ability to make that care. Or perhaps in certain instances where we have a crunch for time, maybe even work with local veterinarians and local private practices to get those animals the care they need in the moment so we can get them out to rescues later. And help the likelihood of them having a positive outcome when they come into the shelter with severe issues. And, and talking about, you know, keep staying on the topic of care in the clinic, we've recently been able to uh, purchase some additional medical equipment, some uh, blood testing equipment, yes. some autoclaves. Tell us how that's benefited the clinic. It's benefited the clinic greatly. We just recently got a very nice, very large autoclave that helps us to prepare more surgery packs so we can do more surgeries a day, hopefully, even when we, especially when we bring another veterinarian to augment our surgical capacity. That autoclave will do pretty much all of our surgical packs at once, which is really quite amazing to have one of that quality and that capacity. Um, even more so than that, my favorite uh, new thing is we have uh, now received blood work machinery. We've were, received a CBC, which is a complete blood count machine, as well as a chemistry panel and a coagulation machine, which basically uh, the CBC measures blood cell levels and white blood cell levels that helps us kind of understand if there is an infection going on, if there is an anemia, what kind it is, how long it's been there to really understand an infection. The chemistry helps us understand different processes in the body based on chemicals within the blood such as liver, liver parameters, kidney parameters, so we can understand how these systems are functioning and working together to make sure these animals are you know, doing well and don't need any extra care or if they do need extra care, how we can direct that more specifically. And the coagulation is a special machine that basically determines if an animal has the ability to clot blood properly if they have a wound or if they have surgery so that we don't, if we have a suspicion that an animal has a clotting issue or is going to bleed profusely during surgery, we will test it with the clotting uh, clotting machine and basically that will tell us if we're going to have an issue with surgery. And if we do, there are some precautions we can take or we can elect to, you know, try to find another route to cure the issue other than surgery and avoid that issue of excessive blood loss. Yeah, I think I think the equipment that we were able to purchase allows us to be a little more proactive in identifying potential issues that we may have with an animal when we're pro- providing it care. And I think that that probably gives you a, a higher degree of certainty of, of what to do in those situations. Absolutely. It adds a lot of, uh, it adds a lot of actual like hard science to the matter. You can make a lot of diagnosis based on what we call pathognomonic symptoms that, you know, it looks like this, it smells like this, it's probably this issue. But if you have the chemistry and you have the CBC and you have all these hard data points that really points you in a direction, it makes a diagnosis much more definitive and helps you really tailor the care to that animal much more specifically and make sure you do it for the proper amount of time, make sure you don't overdo it, make sure you don't underdo it. So it's wonderful to have and I'm 
I'm glad, so glad the city has it. Yeah, and so we've got the equipment that helps us provide the care, and we do provide quite a few surgeries down at the clinic, at the shelter clinic. And from time to time, we bring in contract vets to help us out. Tell us about yes. your uh, contract vets that come in. Our contract vets are basically some great veterinarians that we find. Um, usually, Humane Society helps us find them through different services or different people that we know. Then, what they will do is they'll come in and we'll basically set up a surgery day where I will be doing surgery, the contract vet will be doing surgery, and we can basically double our capacity that day. And since we have, as we mentioned earlier, our wonderful new autoclave, we can keep up with that capacity with our sterilized instruments, and we can do probably twice the surgeries we normally can. And most of these surgeries are sterilizations, such as a neuter or a spay, in order to get these animals compliant with ordinances so they can go to new homes, be returned to owners, go to rescues, and whatever outcome we find for them. But we do also have some surgeries that are any that are life-saving procedures, such as an amputation for a leg that cannot be uh, a broken leg that can't be fixed, or even a broken leg that has no way of being fixed. We have uh, other procedures that are even cosmetic, such as what's called an entropion surgery, where you have a dog that's eyelids rolling up a little bit. We even do some of those every now and then, just to mitigate problems that could come in the future. We have a lot of different surgeries we do at different times, and. With these tools and with uh, having our contract vets come in, we can really do a, little, a lot more of those to help more animals. Right. Dr. Vellin, when you, you get to work about the same time I do every day around 8 o'clock, tell me, a, describe a typical day for Dr. Vallon at the, at the shelter. Typical day for Dr. Vallon at the shelter. I generally get there around 7.30 to 8, and the first thing I like to do is if we have any animals that are in the clinic for hospital care or hospice care, we check on them first, make sure they're doing well, or make sure whatever issue they had that had them in the clinic is still what it is, if it's better, if it's worse, triage that situation. And then I'll run my report for the morning to see if we have a system where any person through the shelter, whether they be Humane Society, kennel technicians, my technicians, or anyone that works there can put in basically a, not really, a, I would say a, a note effectively. They say, this dog has this issue, or this cat has this issue, this cat is acting weird, or this dog is acting weird. And I print out a list of all those notes, and I go through the entire kennel, look at every animal, make sure they all look good, they've been eating their dinner, they've had normal, move, normal bowel movements, everything looks good. And then any of those notes that show up for a specific animal, I look into that, check if that animal has any issues related to that note, and if they do, we'll bring them to the clinic, do a full exam, and remedy that situation. That usually takes, I'd say, about an hour or two, depending on the number of notes and how intensive each situation is. Most of them aren't, most of them are just... A lot of these animals are very stressed. They're in a new environment with a lot more animals than they're used to. So it's a lot of it's just them kind of coping with the situation they're in or injuries that they came in with, and we need to address those as we find them and deal with them as we do. And once that's done, usually three, about three days a week we move to surgery after that. We'll have a surgery three days a week, and those are usually Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we have Monday and Friday for treating patients and dealing with other issues before the weekend or after the weekend. Surgery days generally start with uh, getting getting the animals ready, getting them on the list, uh, making sure they're prepped for surgery. They haven't eaten before that night. Just like humans, animals don't need to eat before surgery. It causes some issues. And then we start up with surgery. We get our machines ready, and we anesthetize animals and perform our neuter or our spay or whatever surgery that animal requires. And then we move to our next one. And we generally probably get with just me there somewhere in the ballpark of 8 to 10 or even if we really push hard 15 surgeries a day just with me there and we'll get up to 30 with another veterinarian in there total and we can usually get those done and we'll do that three days a week and then Fridays are kind of a wrap-up day for the week to check on our surgical patients make sure they're doing well make sure they're ready for the weekend or they're not having any issues or complications post-surgery and make sure they're going to be okay throughout the weekend without as much observation as they get daily right and I think one of the benefits of the surgery schedule you have is that typically we can get those animals out that afternoon. Is that correct? Yes. Usually when we do our surgeries, I personally like to start cutting as early as possible, usually around 9 a.m., maybe 10 at the latest. And then I like to stop around 3 so that if someone's coming in to pick up their dog or an adopter is coming in to pick up their dog, that dog has had time to rest from surgery recuperate from the anesthesia and is usually relatively awake and maybe a little groggy at best, but I like them to be relatively alert and relatively ready to just get up and go before their owner comes to pick them up after surgery. What are some things, you know, it's kind of across the board here, but for the listeners uh, this morning, if you have a dog that comes from the shelter, you know, what are things that are important to do after they have surgery? 
important things for people to watch for surgery is, is really just like any time anyone's had surgery. It's you want to make sure, keep an eye on the incision site. That's one of the biggest, biggest things is whether it's a male or a female, spay or neuter, you want to watch that incision site and make sure that tissue looks healthy. Make sure it's not red. Or make sure it's not inflamed. Make sure there is no discharge or exposed sutures. Um, you want to make sure that they're not getting at it. If, when we put a cone on an animal, it is a very important thing. Unfortunately, like us, they don't understand not to chew at their incision or scratch at their incision. So the cone is a the cone is a very, very important tool to keep them from really hurting themselves by getting that incision open or causing an infection or causing more damage, bleeding, any number of things. So I would say that that's one of the most important is make sure if you're not right there watching your animal 100%, they have their cone on and they are wearing it for that full 10 to 14 days before we pull sutures because that is the last thing anyone wants is then they get you know 10 days down the road from a surgery and then they get that cone off and then they get the suture open and we got to go back in and redo and refix everything and you start back from square one redoing that let's step back for a minute let's uh, talk about folks that they own a pet that didn't come to the shelter just as a vet what are two or three things that are just real critical for pet owners locally to know about pet care and animal care? I would say one of the biggest is rabies vaccination. It's state law, it's city ordinance, and it's one of the most important things you can prevent. Uh, there's every disease that you get other than rabies, it probably can be cured to some degree. Rabies is not curable. There is no cure for rabies. It is pretty much a death sentence for all animals, and it's pretty much also about a 99.9% .9 death percentage for humans, almost basically 100. There have been very, very few cases, and you can probably count on one hand the number of humans that have survived rabies, and even the ones that do have major difficulties afterwards with recovery. So I would say that's one of the biggest, is to prevent that disease because it is so bad, rabies vaccination is a number one. I would say the next is probably considering the climate and the issues we have in Texas, heartworm preventative. There are mosquitoes everywhere. There are going to be mosquitoes everywhere. This year in particular, with the rain we've had this spring, I would say that heartworm preventative is important for every animal. A lot of people will think just indoor animals. I would disagree with that. Mosquitoes get in your house. We all know that. Your dog should all have heartworm preventative. While cats are not as likely to get it, it's something to consider. I know a lot of people do not heartworm prevent their cats, but it's something that if you you really want to be preemptive and you really want to protect your animal, it's something to take seriously and actually talk with your veterinarian and not really consider that situation. But for dogs, especially outdoor dogs or indoor outdoor dogs, I would say heartworm is right up there with importance of rabies because once an animal get heart, gets heartworms, killing heartworms is a relatively dangerous procedure. It can be, it can, it, it's very intensive. It's very, it requires highly of both us and the animal to be safe so they don't get hurt by dying heartworms that are moving through the bloodstream. And so most people, most veterinarians end up doing the, what we call the slow kill method, where we basically put them on preventative and put them on an antibiotic to counteract a bacteria that lives in the heartworm to basically let them outlive them. But even then, heartworms can live up to seven years and even longer in some cases. So it's a long road to hoe if you get heartworms in an animal. So I would say preventative is an important way to avoid those long and expensive bills, of whether you're dealing with the complications of heartworms or just trying to get rid of them once they have them. And after that, really the next one of the top three would be flea and tick preventative. There are a lot of diseases that are carried by fleas and ticks from everything from tapeworms to Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It's very important to prevent fleas and ticks. And if your dog doesn't have fleas and ticks, you're probably not going to have fleas and ticks in your house. And we all know we don't want those. So I would say those are kind of the big three. Big three. I think another one, and it's something that we talk about in the shelter as a whole, is the importance of just doing spay and neuter in general, not necessarily in our clinic, but community-wide, just to help manage the pet populations locally. Oh, absolutely. The, we have a large population of pets. We have an overpopulation of feral dogs and cats. I mean, it's it's always going to be a problem. It's As long as there have been people in cities, there's always there have always been feral dogs and cats, and there probably always will be, but it doesn't mean we can't try to make it less of a problem. Right. So I would say spay and neuters are an important issue. They prevent a lot of issues with your animals. If you've got a male dog and He's neutered. He's far less likely to jump the fence and go looking for a friend. So he's less likely to be out. He's less likely to be hit by a car. He's less likely to get lost. The same thing goes for females. They are also less likely to have a um, what's called a pyometra, which is an infection of the uterus, usually subsequent to a heat, a heat cycle. Um, puppies are expensive, just like babies. So if you can avoid having a litter of puppies, you avoid a pretty heavy expense on your part to keep those puppies healthy. I would say spay as neuters. If you're not if you don't have dogs specifically for breeding and have really looked into that and are an expert in that, I would advise avoiding it. 
and just there are plenty of puppies in the world at the shelter there are plenty of puppies in the world you can buy i would try to get my dog spayed and neutered and really control that population and that way you can avoid a lot of heartache right and you again you run the vet clinic and you've got a couple of uh, vet techs that help you yes sir um tell me about their uh, day-to-day duties that how they help you out down there their day-to-day duties are kind of just you know keeping me on track is a big one and then helping us with helping me with getting animals ready for surgery that's one of the big ones is when i'm in surgery and i'm gloved up and basically in working in an abdomen or neutering a dog and i'm working on a surgery of an amputation or whatever it be they are preparing the next surgery or in some cases like in a more intense surgery like an amputation some of my techs will actually get sterile themselves they'll glove in and they will help me with the surgery if i need someone to help me clamp a vessel or help me move this leg in this position or move this muscle or retract something so that we can reach a certain nerve to tie off or a certain vessel to tie off that way we can do the surgery properly and they can do anything from that to um, a lot of it um, they do an excellent amount in record keeping of keeping records on what we do to each animal the drugs that are given the drugs that are administered for sedation antibiotics any other any other thing like that as well as they keep the clinic exquisitely clean clean we like to work in a clean environment we don't want to be doing surgery in a place that's riddled with gross things so that's a big part of their job is making sure we keep our surgery suite and our exam room tip top clean as a whistle yeah i think that's one of the the important uh task that we have at the at the shelter as well as the clinic is just the sanitation keeping things clean and we've got a a good team of folks down there that do that help us uh, provide a good environment for those animals absolutely anytime you have animals whether it's horses dogs cats or cows if you've got a lot of animals in a small confined area Mm -hmm. it is an immense amount of work to keep a facility clean to keep it sanitary not even for the dogs but for the people working in it it's a lot of work and i think we've done an excellent job thus far since i've been here and and you're kind of a, a unique uh uh, vet because not a lot of cities have full-time vets on staff not to my understanding no i believe a lot of cities unfortunately don't have that luxury i wish more did because i think it would help a lot of cities get this problem of overpopulation and injured dogs under control a lot faster but uh, yeah i would say we're i'm lucky to work here and i think i'm happy to be helping out and doing something pretty good well i can tell you as the director of the department i'm i'm thrilled that you're a part of our team and you do an outstanding job and uh, you do important work for the city of Waco. Um, Is there anything else in closing that you might want to add at this point? Um, The only thing I'd really like to add is I really would encourage people that when you find dogs on the side of the road, we want nothing more than for people to help an animal that is lost, an animal that is abandoned. There, in my opinion, there are very few things worse than animals that are abandoned on the side of the road. There are very few things I despise more and we want people to help those animals. But we also want to try to keep animals out of the shelter so we can keep that low no kill that that no kill rate we've had where it is i don't want to have to have time and space issues so we have a lot of resources with the humane site if you reach out to them with fostering with other rescues with um, finding page pet pets on facebook that have different ways of reaching out to people who've lost their pets so we can get those animals home without them even going to the shelter so we can and that allows us at the shelter to help other animals that don't have those options. Right, and I'll echo that. I, I think our partnership and relationship with the Humane Society of Central Texas is just real critical because they help us get those animals out to positive outcomes. They get Absolutely. them into medical fosters. If the animal has medical issues, they get them into rescues. If they can get them into adoptions. So it's a, it's a tremendous partnership that I think you know it makes, it makes our department a success. Yes, absolutely. No, the Humane Society has helped out a lot on a lot of cases I've dealt with when we have more difficult medical cases that are not going to be a good op- a good out. They're not going to be a good option for people who just want to adopt a dog or someone who just wants to foster for a week or a couple months while they're in school for a semester. They have helped us find rescues that specialize in these med- these intense medical issues or this intense medical re- medical treatment that is required, mm-hmm. and get these animals that really don't have a lot of options to a good and positive outcome so they can get the care they need and we can have the room in the shelter to treat the next one that comes in that needs care well dr valen i think this has been a great conversation we've got a lot of uh good things going on down at the city of waco animal shelter and we're going to keep pressing forward and doing what we can to uh, provide the treatment we need for the animals in the area and uh, work with our local partners and local customer cities and keep uh, doing things to keep taking a taking a lead and and provide, providing animal welfare to our community um, appreciate you coming out today absolutely right. pleasure thank you very much thank you sir this is a uh, trey busby with city talk uh, just had a good visit with dr valen and uh, we appreciate your time and hope you have a good day 
We hope you enjoyed City Talk, a production of the City of Waco. Catch this program on local radio stations on Sunday mornings at 6.30 a.m. Find the podcast on your favorite podcast streaming service by searching City of Waco or view it online at wccc.tv. Thank you.